Our next guest believes that stockpiling medical supplies made in the U.S. is an issue of real national security. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, a Democrat from Michigan, she's running for election right now, joins me now. I can't tell you how grateful, uh, Representative Slotkin, you are with us just a week out from all this other stuff you have going on. Uh, but I know this is a priority for you, and it's a priority for the country. So let me just be point blank. What's broken that needs to be fixed? Well, listen, you know, a lot of my experience um, in the sort of the worst of it in March and April really came down to um, the fact that things like medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, just major supply chains that help keep us safe um, were just so outsourced to places like China, we couldn't get a hold of them when we really needed them. And my experience in the Pentagon and in the national security world, it, it kind of blew my mind that while we still really have a preference for making things in America on you know, our military equipment, our body armor, our meals ready to eat, we didn't have the same Buy American requirements on other things like medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. Um, obviously the stockpile, we opened that sucker up and a lot of it was expired here in Michigan. We got moldy stuff, a lot less than what we were expecting. Um, so we have to uh, make sure that there's a, a better way uh, to stockpile equipment um, when we need it. Um, and then in general, I think it just really combines kind of my national security background with sort of major American manufacturing. And, you know, here in Michigan, we've been saying for 30 years that if you outsource too far, you're going to get caught with your pants down at some point. And I feel like we did. You know, if I'm haggling with a Chinese middleman in the middle of the night, for a 78 cent mask, like something has gone wrong. So that's been the focus of our work since basically April. Do you, where does your legislation now that I just mentioned with Secretary Sebelius strengthening America's strategic national stockpile, I've talked to some other industry leaders that are in, in pharmaceutical production and they've been talking about, you know, look, you can identify the top 100 most needed, you know, therapies and medicines that are out there and, and figure this out, that it's doable. Where, where, where does this stand now? Sure. So it's actually a series of seven bills, um, completely bipartisan, 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans, built purposely bipartisan because this issue should be bipartisan. They all passed the House in September. Um, and now we're in negotiation to have them in the next COVID package. You know, this thing that Mnuchin mm -hmm. and Pelosi have been struggling to negotiate. Um, uh, those bills are in there. And my hope is once we get past the election, we're actually able to get something done. I've been frustrated that we haven't um, before the election. Um, and um, it, it's something that, frankly, we should be moving on now. And the biggest part of it is this $500 million pilot program for public-private partnerships on extra lines, particularly extra pharmaceutical lines for the very thing you were mentioning. When we need to surge and go, uh, the American government has an, uh, an interest in being partners on additional surge capacity. So. Um, I'm, that's the, the part I'm most excited about. Have you talked to industry leaders? How have they, how do they feel um, in terms of their partnership with government and in terms of what they know is going to be a big lift, the big load of new vaccines and therapeutics that's going to have to be deployed pretty to every corner of the country? Um, are you finding them to be robust partners? Is it, is it a good, good track or do you have concerns? Well, listen, we have one of these companies um, that's now being uh, sort of at the ready for when the vaccine is, is um, you know, identified, they're ready to go and ramp up in production here in my district, Endo. Um, but uh, we've been talking to them and others about, you know, everyone talks about manufacturing more in the United States, but you have to make sure you're talking to the industry to figure out what truly incentivizes people, mm. right? You can't just decide from Washington that you know what's going to, you know, bring manufacturing back. We have such a globalized supply chain, you know, we have such an ecosystem that there's a ton of things that just, they come from all parts of the globe. And you, it's more than just saying, come on back. Um, so what I want to really do is hear from our business leaders. And I was in this um, great group called Business Executives for National Security. They've done an after action on our supply chains. Um, and I was one of the, the members of that commission that looked at it. Um, you got to really talk to the, the leaders in industry to figure out how you properly incentivize additional production in the United States. It can't be made up from Washington. You know, one of the, the things that I wanted to talk to you about is your, is your CIA background, you know, your, your background as an analyst. I happened to talk earlier this week to Rick Bright. Rick Bright was the BARDA official um, uh, who said that he was pushed out of that job. He recently left government and came in and 
He said something, and it's on Alex Gibney's new show on the COVID crisis uh, called Totally Under Control, that I didn't realize. I mean, a lot of people look back to a playbook that was developed during the Obama period that was there on the shelf, but they did a simulation. You know, you did simulations in the CIA. You did exercises in October of 2019 that anticipated this kind of pandemic that looked at all the government responses that looked at partnership with industry and then actually underscored the very weaknesses and decision that, that we're, we saw. Is there any awareness that that playbook that not the playbook, but that that, that simulation occurred highlighting many of these gaps um, among your colleagues in Congress and the need to fill them? Because I was astonished to hear that that the Trump administration already had this experience in hand. Um, it, it, I don't know how widespread and you know that knowledge is, but I certainly, and anyone with a national security background from any administration, knows that there are people in each administration who look at these kinds of scenarios for a living. I mean, they have a whole Homeland Security Council um, at the White House. I know people who are working over there, and I know that there are people who were focused on this. They just, the, it's a difference between having folks in the system who look at this problem set and then having it rise to the level of senior leaders where they're gonna do something about it. And the most important thing in dealing with the federal response is intent. You know, do you have the will and intent to lead from the White House or lead from Washington? And I think it was this paralysis that came from sort of not wanting to accept the gravity of the problem, not wanting to accept that the federal government actually was the best place to respond in a lot of these scenarios. Um, and uh, uh, those two things meant that we just got way too late of a start. Um, and while this kind of thing would have stretched any administration of any party, um, the fact that they backed away from that leadership role uh, meant that they didn't even seek out the expertise that might have already been in their administration. What are the other uh, critical supplies that you think the nation needs and what would some of the partnership with the private sector uh, look like from your perspective? Yeah, I think we actually need to do a soup to nuts look at what are the supply chains with the national security value. I got to tell you, as someone who, um, you know, is from Michigan, where obviously we're never far from thinking about vehicles and vehicle production, um, there's certain batteries, um, certain capacity around um, energy storage that we depend on a lot of other company or countries for um, that we don't want to do without. Um, there's certainly uh, a lot of technology around superconductors that we're at risk of, um, you know, having to depend on other other countries. Well, we actually think we need, and, and I wrote this into the Defense Department budget um, it, through my role in the Armed Services Committee, is a soup to nuts look and identification mm -hmm. of the very specific, you know, supply chains with national security importance. Um, and then once we identify that list, we can look at incentivizing more production here at home. But we got to agree upon that list, right? We have to have a common understanding and be able to review it every few years. Right. Um, but certainly energy storage um, is a big one that we would be loath to live without. Well, Representative Alyssa Slotkin, I really appreciate your insights and what you're doing to think through this ecosystem of how to be smarter. Um, uh, than perhaps we have been. So I'm really grateful for your time. I know how busy you are. And so thanks for joining us for today's uh, program. Thanks so much.